Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, we're going to be having a water baptism this evening. We'll have it right out here on our new patio. And uh, in anticipation and preparation for that, I want to talk about baptism this morning. What it is, what it means, why we do it. And I'd like to begin by looking at a passage of Scripture that has come to be known as the Great Commission, which is over in Matthew chapter 28. It's the last verses of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 18 and 20. So if you have your Bible, you can flip over to Matthew 28. And beginning in verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and said to them, his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I think the first question that often comes to mind for us is, why is this called the Great Commission? I mean, that's a pretty grand title to give this particular passage. What does the word commission even mean? And why is this the Great Commission? Well, a commission, commission is an authorized command, a charge, a duty, a directive. A closely related word is the word mission, which is the carrying out of the commission. People often use these two words, commission and mission, interchangeably because of the difference between them is so subtle and, you know, whichever is fine with me. It doesn't bother me how you use or misuse those words. Uh, the, the idea is basically the same either way. When we call these verses the Great Commission, and we could say even the Great Mission of the church, we mean that what Jesus says here is that this is the great duty and the great directive that he has given to his followers. This is the great charge that is to drive what we do and why we do it. This is the grand mission of the church. These are our marching orders as his followers. What is this great commission that he's given us? Well, in verse 18, Jesus begins by stating his right and authority for giving us this grand charge. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Jesus is over every and all realms, both physically and spiritually. There's nothing that is not under his authority in all of existence except for the Godhead itself, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To say it uh, maybe in a more uh, common vernacular, we would say he's the boss of everything. It's his rightful place to issue directives to us and anyone else that he chooses to. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul writes, he's talking about the sacrifice that Jesus made in giving himself on the cross for us. And then he he brings it to a therefore in verse 9 of Philippians 2. And he says, therefore, God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think it's interesting that when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness just before he began his public ministry, Satan offered to give Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world if he would bow down and worship him. You might remember that during his temptation. And Jesus refused. Because of Jesus' obedience and submission to the will of the Father, going through the suffering and the death of crucifixion, Jesus now has more than Satan could have ever given him. So Satan had offered him all of the kingdoms of the world. Jesus refused that. He submitted himself in obedience to the Father, gave his life to the Father. And the result is, is that all things have been put underneath him. And the application for us is that there is great reward in obedience and submission to our Heavenly Father. That reward may not come in the current moment that we're living in, but it will come. 
It says that we will be co-heirs with Jesus. Verse 19 continues and it says, Go therefore, Jesus says, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He says, go and make disciples. A disciple of Jesus is someone who is in relationship with God through Jesus, following him as Lord and teacher. He says, go make disciples of all nations. Every person in this world is invited to become a disciple of Jesus. We, as his followers, are to seek to make disciples of every person in this world. There are no restrictions. No one is left out. No one is left uninvited. It doesn't matter what their economic status, their social status, their education, their gender, their race, their creed, their history, their sinfulness. All are called. All are welcomed. All are invited. All who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved, it tells us in Romans 10, 13. It says, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, we're going to talk about the baptizing in more detail in a moment, but I want us to notice here that the entire triune God has Head is involved in this invitation and the salvation that comes. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all invite, all rescue, all are part of the life-changing salvation of people. In Christ, we have a new father, we have a new brother, and we have a new comforting companion in the Holy Spirit. This is teaching them to observe or to do or to obey all that I have commanded you. Observing, doing, obeying all that Jesus has commanded is what his disciples do. So, Jesus is telling us to teach others to do the same things we're supposed to be doing. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus, at the end of this, promises to be with his disciples always. He will never leave us. He will not abandon us. He has not given us this great commission and then left us to fend for ourselves. Jesus has promised to help us with this great commission. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will be with us, working in us, on us, through us, for us, around us. So simply stated, the great commission that Jesus has given to his followers is to make Every person in this world, a follower of Jesus, just like we are supposed to be. The world has all kinds of ideas about what they think the mission of the church is supposed to be. In our own day, the followers of Jesus are constantly scrutinized, criticized, judged, maligned, and told what our mission and responsibilities ought to be, are supposed to be. And we readily admit, don't we, that we are a long way from the ideals that Jesus has called us to. We're very much a work in progress. Amen? But what we are to be and what we are to be doing as followers of Jesus comes from him, not the world. The world does not set the church's agenda. Jesus does. It's very important that we remember that because it, it, it's easy for the church to let itself get pressured into trying to meet the expectations of others, chasing their programs and their priorities and their agendas and their goals and their missions. And, you know, some of those things are great causes, but they are not the great commission that Jesus has given to us. It's not the agenda that Jesus has given to us. What we have here in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, is the great commission of the church, which has come directly from our founder and leader, Jesus. It's important that this always be our main mission. Well, part of the Great Commission is baptizing the disciples of Jesus, and this is what we want to spend the remainder of our time today talking about. Let's begin by looking at baptism in the Bible. 
one of the first places in the Bible that we find a kind of baptism is in the Old Testament ceremony of washing that's practiced by the priests as a means of being cleansed and made ready to appear before holy God. When Aaron was ordained as the first priest, Moses washed him with water, symbolizing the removal of sin, preparing Aaron to enter into God's holy presence. Again, on the Day of Atonement, the special day of the year when the high priest would enter the most holy place in the tabernacle and offer blood to atone for the sins of the people, the priest would wash himself with water before going in before the Lord, symbolizing the need to be cleansed and made ready to appear before this pure and holy God. Well, Christian baptism includes a similar idea. Baptism has, as part of its symbolism, the idea of being washed and made clean so that we can be in God's holy presence. Spiritually, we are washed with the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from our sin and makes it possible for us to stand in God's holy presence, blameless before him. Baptism symbolizes this cleansing by the lifeblood of Jesus. But Christian baptism is not the same as the washing ceremonies practiced in the Old Testament. Christian baptism means more than just cleansing from sin. John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance to the people of his day, preparing them for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Over in Mark chapter 1, verse 4, for example, it says, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Well, Christian baptism, it includes this idea of repentance too. Baptism has as part of its symbolism a turning away from our old life, lived on our own terms, to a life devoted to God, living on His terms instead, seeking to do His will rather than our own will. But Christian baptism is not the same as the baptism that John the Baptist was doing. John's baptism was an act of repentance. Christian baptism means more than simply repentance from sin. We have the example of Jesus himself being baptized. A little further down in Mark chapter 1, in verse 9, it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, who was doing a baptism of repentance. But Jesus, he didn't need to repent of any sin. He had never sinned, so he had no sin to repent of. So why did he get baptized by John? Well, he was identifying with us, for one, in our humanity and all of the brokenness and the sin that comes along with that. He was setting us an example to follow in being baptized. And his baptism served as an inauguration of his ministry. When, when Jesus came up out of the water, it says the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove and the voice of God, the Father spoke, making the declaration, you are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And then this marked the formal beginning of Jesus' public ministry. So in a similar way, our baptism is a public declaration of our new life as a follower of Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached his first sermon after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, the people were cut to the heart by the message, and they asked him, what shall we do? In Acts 2, 37, it says, now when they heard this, this sermon of Peter's, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then we skip down to verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added 
that day about 3,000 souls. So on what some consider the first day of the church, the new believers who came to faith in Jesus, they were baptized. And the same thing takes place throughout the book of Acts. Every time someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, commits their life to following him, they're baptized. What does baptism mean? We've talked a little bit about that already. It symbolizes the washing away of sin by the blood of Jesus Christ, similar to the ceremonial washings performed under the Old Testament law by the priests. It symbolizes repentance, turning away from our old way of life and toward our new life, similar to the baptism of repentance performed by John the Baptist. It serves to inaugurate our new life as a follower of Jesus. But Christian baptism means more than that. Baptism symbolizes that we have been united with Jesus in his death, buried with him, putting our old life to death, and we are united with Jesus in his resurrection, being raised to a new life. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul writes this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, the symbolism that we have in the baptism is as we are going under the water, it symbolizes the burying of our old self, of our old life. And as we come back up out of the water, it symbolizes us being raised up to a new life. We've been raised up with Jesus to a new life. We are a new creation in Jesus. The old you is dead and the new you has come to life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ... He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And baptism gives us this visual representation of what's actually taken place in reality in the spiritual realm. Well, baptism, too, is a public declaration that we are a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, and a member of his family, the church. When baptized, we're making a pledge that we are a member of this new family, the church, and are making ourselves accountable to it. We're also making a public declaration that we are leaving our old life behind and dedicating ourselves to following Jesus. Our allegiance is with him now. We're throwing in with Jesus. We're choosing sides with Jesus. We are joining ourselves to Jesus. Well, who should be baptized? All disciples of Jesus Christ should be baptized. All followers of Jesus Christ should be baptized. Baptism is a sacred act, not something to be taken lightly. So if you are not a real believer and follower of Jesus Christ, you should not be baptized. You would be making a mockery of this sacred thing. If you were baptized early in life before you made a personal decision of your own to become a disciple of Jesus, you should consider being baptized again. Now, I know that that might rub some parents the wrong way who have had their child baptized as a baby. But baptism should be something that we each choose to do on our own as part of our own personal life with Jesus Christ. The Bible it doesn't teach that regeneration takes place in the act of baptism. In other words, baptism does not save a person, making us alive to God. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in his saving work, rather than any act or rite that we might follow, like baptism or communion or whatever else. Infant baptism 
can be seen as a demonstration of the parent's commitment to Christ, but when a child reaches the age of responsibility for their own life before God, they ought to make their own decision to follow the Lord and being baptized is part of that. Well, how old are, should you be to be baptized? You have to be old enough to understand the commitment that you're making to follow Jesus with your life. I know some parents uh, are tempted to push their kids to be baptized before they're really ready, but there's no reason to do that, mom and dad. Remember, baptism doesn't save a person. So there's no reason to push your child to be baptized. It's not like they're going to miss heaven if they don't get baptized. Our focus as parents should be on our children having a saving faith in Jesus and loving him with their lives. If they have a genuine faith and love for Christ, they're going to make the decision to be baptized on their own. And when they do that, it's going to be a beautiful thing for you as a parent to see and be part of. Well, why should we be baptized? Well, first, and really the only answer that's needed, assuming that we are a follower of Jesus Christ, is that he commands us to be baptized. That should be good enough right there. Told us to do it, we should do it. And he told us to do it. It's an act of obedience to Jesus Christ for us to be baptized if we are a follower of Jesus. Baptism is not essential for our salvation. It doesn't save us but it is essential for living an obedient life as a follower of Jesus Christ. Second, why would you not want to be baptized if you are really a follower of Jesus Christ? I made a promise to my wife to love her and remain faithful to her as long as I live. And as a public testimony of that commitment, we went through a wedding ceremony and I wear a wedding ring. Well, when we're baptized, we're making a declaration to the world that we have pledged our devotion and love to Jesus Christ for as long as we live. It's kind of like a wedding ceremony in that sense. So we might challenge ourselves and say, hey, you know, if you're a follower of Jesus, then make the commitment. I knew when I got baptized, it was going to raise the stakes on me in regards to my commitment to Jesus Christ. The Lord brought me to a, a point where I had to either put up or shut up, so to speak. How serious was I about really following Jesus Christ? I mean, was I willing to take my faith in him far enough that I couldn't really turn back anymore? See, and for me, I knew that being baptized was going to do that in my life. Standing before the rest of the church and the world and being baptized, it was going to burn a bridge in my life, so to speak. I knew that I had to burn that bridge if I was really going to be a follower of Jesus in the fullest way that I could. There may be some of you here today who are wrestling and you have been wrestling with the decision to be baptized or not. Yeah, well, you know, I've been a Christian for so long now. I mean, what's the point? Hey, if you're a Christian and you haven't been baptized yet, you should be baptized. We've just been talking about that, right? So don't give me this, oh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's been so long now. Yeah, it's been so long. It's time for you to do it. Some of, some of you may be thinking, I don't know, man. It's like, I believe in Jesus, I love Jesus, I'm following Jesus, but you know, I might want to still bail. Like, really? <laughs> it's time for you to burn that bridge that leads back to your old life. It's time for you to close that door to your old life. Take the doorstop out. Let it close. The Lord's challenging you today 
to take that step of public testimony about your faith in Jesus Christ. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to have a baptism this evening here at the church. And today is the perfect day for you to be baptized if you've not been baptized yet. And you are a follower of Jesus. And I want to encourage you to do that. If you're going to be baptized, it's real simple. Just bring something to wear that you don't mind getting wet in. That's it. To those of you who have already been baptized, first, I, I hope and I pray that you've been reminded today of your first love, Jesus, and the promise that you made to him on the day that you were baptized, kind of like a wedding, kind of like it was a wedding day for you. What a beautiful time it was, right? What a milestone in your life as a follower of Christ. And it's good for us to be present as an encouragement to our brothers and sisters who are taking this important step in their own Christian life. So please make plans to be here to support them. So I close just with Jude 24. It's a, it's a beautiful blessing for all of us. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a closing prayer. Lord, we, we thank you for the good work that you have done in our life and that you continue to do in our life. I pray that today, Lord, those here who are followers, but they've never really stepped out and been baptized. I pray, Lord, that today they're, they're going to do that today, that they're going to be baptized. You would call them into this beautiful milestone in their life as your follower, as your child. So, Lord, I, I pray, too, that for those of us who have been baptized, that you would bring to remembrance for us today that special moment in our own life. And that it would strengthen and renew our commitment to you, Lord, today. We have a heavenly father. We have a brother in Jesus. And we have this companion in the Holy Spirit who continues to do good work changing us inside to be more like Jesus. Bless each one in Jesus' name. Amen.